okay so welcome to class um, so last few classes we've been talking about um, how we essentially the importance of stakeholders and how we manage them right and the reason stakeholders are so important is because we've also seen from our case studies that you know environmental groups citizens opposition parties uh, all of these kinds of organizations can put pressure on infrastructure projects and that might influence the outcome of projects not to mention contractors suppliers etc right so maybe one way of summing it up rather concisely is uh, there are a number of interests on projects and to the extent that we can align those interests then the project is likely to be more successful right so if the contractors incentive the developers incentive the ngos the people who are using it everyone's interests are aligned it's likely that you're going to have a favorable outcome versus otherwise right and so a lot of what we've been talking about in the last few classes negotiation design thinking uh, you know these uh, social network analysis etc are all meant for us to try to align the views of various stakeholders but we've been focusing quite a bit at what we might call stakeholders at the fringes right so we talked about design thinking we were talking about users right when we talked about negotiation you're talking about NGOs special interest groups all of that but you know clearly the main stakeholders on a project are it could be the government the sponsor the developer um, and it's unclear we've not really talked very much about what do we do if anything to modify the views of these stakeholders do we say that you know, the government has a view or the private developer has the view now has a view and now we need to uh, figure out ways in which they can convince other people right in which case we are sort of assuming that the private developer and the government have a view that does not need to be changed uh, right and all they need to do is develop better tools and technologies to understand and convince their stakeholders or do we also take the view that the the reverse should also work right we should also have provisions where uh, key stakeholders like governments like financiers like project sponsors alter their views around a project in order to better fit with everyone outside right so i hope you get the distinction earlier we are talking more about how do I as a central player on the project influence users and NGOs etc uh, right without necessarily asking the question how do I get influenced in turn right so how do I get uh, banks and governments and sponsors to change the way in which they think about projects to ensure that they are actually designing projects that are uh, or selecting projects that are much more likely to meet with everyone's expectations right so today we are going to talk a little bit about uh, frameworks and tools that should be used internally within these large organizations not things that you use in order to convince uh, you know a user or a special interest group right so we're going to talk about two things we're going to talk about this thing called the equator principles um, right and then we'll also talk about uh, you know a framework for essentially assessing impact uh, rooted in in an area called industrial ecology right so we'll do these sequentially we'll first talk about the equator principles then we'll discuss them a little bit and then we'll talk about uh, you know the industrial ecology based framework okay so it's group 2 now okay so who is going to present the equator principles yeah yeah so equator principle uh, equator principle is a risk management framework adopted by financial institu uh, financial institution for determining the accessing and managing uh, and managing the environmental and social risks in the project finance so uh, like if we come to a small summary like what is the equator principle so about equator principle there is three, uh, three things is the equator principle financial institution equator principle management structure and the 10 equator principles and, and from the social environmental sustainability rating uh, sustainability marketing rating com company value increase and the equator principle and social and environmental rating framework uh, and the from project uh, appraisal scheme early project review and the risk categorization and project social and environmental risk uh, assessment action plan and social environmental management program so this is the equator principle management structure so from the top there is a steering committee and equator principle financial instruction chair and the ifc engagement as in uh, steering committee there are two companies ebn amro um, banco it it uh, etc and there are two companies in the equator principal financial institution chair banco itau and the macro um, but and that there is a working um, uh, like top in the bottom there is a few working groups is there in the adoption there is a uh, ing um, you know, yeah, Bancorial and the Kalyan 
HBC or BC, the best practice that is the city, the county Lawrence and the associate general, general and the ciliary uh, region, all those things and the climate, there is a uh, few grip in the climate change in the governance, outreach and the scope review in the uh, stakeholder. Stakeholder, there are uh, few major companies is the NGOs, HUV, Genus, uh, Kubush and uh, Stees, Kalyan, Eric and the uh, client, and there are uh, clients is there, cities and the uh, Sean Miller. There is Kane Equator principle, principle one, review and the categorization. So when a project is proposed for a financing and equator of principal financial institution uh, will as uh, as part of the in internal social and environmental review and do the diligence and categorize such project based on the magnitude of its uh, potential impact and the risks in the acc accordance with the environmental and social screening criteria of the internal finance corporation. Principle two, social and environmental assessment for the for each project assessed has been uh, their category A and category or category B, there are on the um, borrower has conduct a social and environmental assessment process to address as appropriate and the EPI, uh, FI uh, that uh, equator principal financial institution satis uh, satisfaction the rele relevant social and environmental impact uh, and the risks of the proposed project. Principle three. There is a, uh, applicable social and environmental standards. The assessment will be referred to the uh, to the then applicable IFC performance standard and then uh, applicable industry specific environmental health, health and safety guideline. The assessment will be established to participating um, participating uh, EPI EPFI EPI satisfaction the project's overall compliance with or just uh, satis justified. A deviation from the respective performance of the standard and EHS guideline. Uh, principle, uh, principle 4, the action plan and the management system for all category A and category B project, the, bra, um, the Brower and has prepared the action plan which address the relevant find, uh, finding and draws on the co conclusion of the assessment and the AP will, will describe the um, Priority, uh, priorities and the action needed to be implement mitigation measure and corporate action and monitoring measure necessary to manage the impact and the risks identified in the assessment. Practice principle five, um, five the con consultation, uh, consultation and the disclosure for all category A and B project the government brower and the third party exp expert or has con consulted the project affected communities and the process will ensure that their free, their free prior and the informed consultation and the facilitate uh, their informed participation. In principle 6, there is a grievance mechanism for all category A and B project to ensure that the consulta consultation and the disclosure and community in in engagement uh, continues throughout the construction and the operation of the project. The borrower will be um, scaled, uh, scaled to the risks and the adverse impact uh, of the project establish a, a grievance mechanism as part of the management system. They will allow the borrower to receive the faci facilitated and the resolution of the concern about the project social and environmental performance raised by a individual or groups from the among project and affected communities. Principle 7, independent review for the project with the issues that may pose the significant adverse impact risk client should um, consider the retaining external expert to the assist in the conduct of all the part of the assessment and this expert should have the relevant and recognized a experience in the similar project and uh, operate the identi identically from those responsible uh, for the design and construction. They should be engage, uh, engaged early in the project development phase and as necessary in the various stage of project design and construction and the co commissioning. Principle 8, convey, important strength of the principle is incorporated 
participation of the convent uh, link to the uh, compliance for a category A and category B the project borrower will convent in financing and documentation. Uh, one uh, there is uh, to comply the, with all the relevant host to country social and environmental laws and regulation. There are two the uh, com comply with the AP during the construction and operation of the project to And there are commitments of uh, and, uh, to the six principles the commitments of the sustainability, corporate sustainability rating, uh, paradigm is business approach to the create a long term uh, shareholder value by integrating the opportunity and managing the deriving risk, uh, risk and from economic and environmental and social factors. Commitment uh, to do not harm, preventing and minimizing the environmentally and socially determined Determinal impacts of the portfolios and their operation. Commitment to the responsibilities for the environmental and social impacts on their uh, transaction. Commitment to the accountability. Stakeholder must have major role in financial decision. Commitment to the transparency should be transparent to the stakeholder. And commitment to the sustainable and market government, market uh, mechanism which facilitated the sustainability and fostered the full cost accounting of the social and environmental externality. Okay, so this is some idea of what are the equator principles, but I am not sure that we have very clear ideas, so we will get into that. But what I also want to talk about is why are they here and what impact uh, do they have, right? So first of all, uh, again, and Shubham had a definition in his first slide, but what are the equator principles? Someone like quickly, so the lay person asked you on the street. I have heard about equator principles, what are they? So essentially look, these are some principles that I am asked to follow uh, in order to minimize environmental and social damage, alright, that is fundamentally what these are. Now because I do that, I might have a greater chance of getting money from banks and uh, in the process of doing that, I might have risk mitigation, all of that. But fundamentally, this is a, almost like a code of conduct, uh, right, so it is a framework, it is a set of principles. Right, and the, the point of having these equator principles is to say, okay, this is a standard, I want all of you guys to follow the standard, because if you follow the standard, then you are likely to minimize harm to society and the environment, right. So it stems from the fundamental premise that many infrastructure projects have economic value, um, right, they create jobs, they produce energy which can be sold, um, they allow for transportation of goods which has a value and all of that, so there is economic value that is being created, but in the process, there is social and environmental harm that is often done because I have to clear away natural environment, I have to resettle people, uh, all of these things sort of happen and generally the presumption is that we tend to not pay enough attention to the social harm as we do to the economic growth. So economic growth trumps uh, environmental and social considerations and therefore if I have a, a high IRR or an NPV, I go ahead with these projects um, and that is primarily because Right, why in the past, why do we go ahead with high NPV projects, right, what is the rationale? Why do not we sort of say, oh no, this is a high NPV but high environmentally sensitive or socially sensitive project, uh, let us not go ahead with it, right, why do not we make that argument? What is, what do you think is the fundamental difficulty? So it becomes, there is no proper framework to measure, measure when you say measure this, measure what? or the, the environmental and social harm that you are creating. So it is very clear the value I am getting, I can measure that in rupee terms or dollar terms or whatever. It, I find it very difficult to measure the harm that I am causing, right. And often if I find it difficult, then I do not measure it, right. So I essentially say, okay, qualitatively there is some harm that I am causing, quantitatively there are benefits that I am getting, so I am going to go ahead with it, right. And qualitatively in order to, um, you know, mitigate the harm that I am ca causing, I will qualitatively do something in response like preparing an environmental management plan. So yes, I am destroying something, so I will create something, right, but I do not know what the balance is, right. So very often we have two problems. Problem one is it is very difficult to quantify, right, what a harm because it is very subjective and we will get into that. Second is uh, the financial benefits are often near term, right, the environmental consequences are often longer term, right. So for instance, if I deforest 
uh, a large area and somebody complains to me and says, oh, you know what, you're going to help increase global warming because the capacity of sequestering carbon dioxide has come down, right, because you've taken away trees, okay. Uh, and we look at it and we say, okay, by the time 2035 or 2040 comes along, right, this is actually going to be a critical issue. And uh, let's say I even put a value to it at 2035 or 2040. Even if I put a value to it, if I discount it in a discounted cash flow manner to 2018, then whatever value that I would have put in in 2040 will be discounted by so much that it might be trivial today compared to the near term cost, the benefits and costs that I will be playing around with, right. And so generally what has happened is we have tended to make decisions more economically, right. So let's look at costs, let's look at economic benefits and decide on projects, all right. And clearly we, we realize through the many case studies we've looked at that that may not necessarily be fair, uh, right, because, you know, just because you happen to live close to a river which is being dammed, uh, you know, should you give up your entire life and be resettled, so there's an ethical question. Uh, there's also the question of project success because as we've seen, these people can band together, form larger coalitions, um, you know, etc. right. So we need to have some set of principles or ideas that allows us to consider the economic, environmental and social consequences also, right, this is the premise. Now the question is, okay, fine, okay, that's all logical, it's easy to say, I need some principles, uh, right. So then the question is, what should those principles be, okay, and how do I, um, you know, get those principles to be accepted, right. So, you know, in India, you have the Bureau of Indian Standards, the Bureau of Indian Standards comes up with codes, right. Once I have a, an IS code, you know, IS 456 for concrete, we don't debate about it, right, we use it, of course. Uh, we might over a period of time change these codes because new technologies come in, etc. But there is a legitimate authority, the Bureau of Indian Standards that has come up with codes for everything from what the Indian flag should look like to what, uh, uh, you know, uh, concrete, the way in which concrete should be poured and, you know, uh, specifications around that. So, do we actually get governments to come up with frameworks which also have social and environmental considerations with them? What do we do? Right. So, in this question, so maybe I will get somewhere. So, in, in terms of this particular argument, uh, how did, how do you sort of go about this? Right. So, in the particular case of the equator principles, what happened? But even otherwise, how do you go about creating principles? So, first thing is put things into numbers and we will come to that, right, because that is going to be a big part of today's discussion. But let us say you figured that part out, right. So, let us say you have come up with principles, okay. How do you ensure that people adopt these principles, right. So, the argument here in the equator principles case is, look, at the end of the day, projects are financed, right, and the financiers really determine whether projects are going to take off or not. So, governments might decide that they want this kind of a project, but ultimately, if there is no finance behind it, right, then these projects will not take off, right. So, the key players in infrastructure projects are the financiers. And so, the question is, can I influence the finance, right, is essentially one argument, yeah, you want to continue, anything more to add to that? So, in this case, there are a number of parallel things that have been happening. So, there is this environment versus economic growth debate, right, what has been done. So, many things happen. So, there are stock markets like the Dow Jones, the stock indices, right, market indices that came up with a sustainability index, okay. Uh, the World uh, Economic Forum also came up with a environmental sustainability index across countries. So, essentially what these, these indices try to do is a process that sometimes people call well, uh, in some cases people call it naming and shaming, but this is a bit of the opposite, okay. Uh, this is a bit of the opposite where you are actually trying to uh, highlight people who have done well. So, the World Economic Forum's Environmental Sustainable Index highlights countries that have sustainable practices and perhaps saying, okay, public perception might push people to invest in these countries, right. And all of this again took place, it's been, it's been taking place over the last two, three decades, more or less since we had that famous world convention on dams in 1992 where we had this thing called the Brundtland, uh, you know, report, right, and the Brundtland definition of sustainability. Anyone remember the Brundtland definition of sustainability, right, the World Commission of Dams in 1992, this guy called Brundtland who defined sustainability, right, and he defined sustainability as the ability to develop without uh, impinging upon the rights of future generations. So, he says sustainable development is development where whatever you do today does not reduce the choices available for future generations, right. So, in other words, if I burn a renewable resource, then that is not available to future generations because it takes, you know, millions of years in order for, uh, you know, coal to be formed, for instance. So, the moment I release the energy from coal, 
I'm actually depriving future generations of doing that and therefore that is not necessarily sustainable. But by the same token, if I harness wind energy today, it's not like there is less wind energy for, uh, you know, people next year, right? Because these wind cycles are more or less going to come on an annual basis, right? So that was the logic. So underneath that logic, there were lots of these efforts to say, okay, we need to be more sustainable, right? And some of these efforts came up, okay? Let's start uh, identifying companies that are sustainable, countries that are sustainable, etc. right? So 1990s, so United Nations Environment Program, right? So they got financial institutions to sign up to this, okay? Um, all of these. Uh, in the UK, right? So the UK took a little bit of a lead in uh, 2002 with something that they called the London principles and they got a lot of financial institutions because again there's a recognition that financial institutions uh, really help push projects forward, right? And the financial institutions were asked to sign up to these principles and essentially saying you will lend only to projects that have, right? Some of these kinds of characteristics and if you guys agree to that and you only lend to those kinds of projects, then only those kinds of projects will take off and if those are sustainable principles, then we'll have a bunch of sustainable projects, right? Um, but then sort of the, uh, all of these were localized, right? Okay, so this is for London, okay, or the UK, fine, right? But the same thing is not happening in the Middle East or in China or in Africa, etc. Um, but in 2000 thing, there was something called the Colavecchio declarations, right? And essentially, this was NGO-led. So the NGOs took the lead and said, look, we'll draft those principles, right? What are they, they are? Maybe they, we will sort of quantify them, we'll qualify them, whatever, but we'll come up with a list of principles, right? And these will be principles that we feel are really important. And so anyone who develops a project must adhere to these kinds of principles. And those principles could be things like completely avoid resettlement, right? Or you will fund projects only when there is no resettlement. Or if there is resettlement, then the terms of resettling should be, right? Something that's favorable to the project community, right? Or whatever. So you can have whatever you want in there. Um, right, so you can have, you can say, I want an environmental management plan that goes into this kind of detail. So these are just ideas and principles, but the Colavecchio declarations were promoted by NGOs. And um, so we are, you, you can see that between 1992 and 2002, there's been a lot of thinking about this, because a lot of projects are failing, uh, the stakeholder viewpoint is coming up, we sort of understand that there's no, the debates on climate change are starting to happen, we're talking more about sustainable development, we're worried about, uh, at that point of time, the fact that we are over-reliant on coal as a source of energy and those reserves will be depleting at a certain point of time. So, a lot of these initiatives are happening. Uh, so, when we look at what's common, they all focus on financial institutions, right? So, this is common, okay? Because everyone says, look, these are the guys, if we can catch them, right? Uh, you know, then we really can solve the problem. There's no point catching government because they'll be here today, gone tomorrow. Somebody else will be in their place. There's no point catching a private developer because if this developer says no, someone else will come in their place, right? But if we can catch the banks, right, the sources, that's important, right? Um, and so essentially they say, look, we need regulations, right, to protect environmental and, and human rights. So these are great. The problem is, uh, these are all general statements, right? So if someone says, okay, what are the principles you want me to follow? And if you say, do no harm, okay, that's fine. I mean, I, I would like to not do harm, but you've got to be a bit more prescriptive. You've got to tell me, you know, what does that mean? You know, am I looking at land? Am I looking at labor? Am I looking at housing, resettlement? Uh, you know, flooding, you know, what are the things that you want me to take care of, right, when I do my project, okay? Um, and so these are, so essentially what is happening is a lot of people are coming out with ideas saying, okay, you guys must commit, you must, you must have sort of an honor code, okay, I will not harm the environment without necessarily telling us how to do this, okay? So in response to this is where uh, the IFC, which is uh, uh, the World Bank's private lending arm, so the World Bank uh, has an arm called the IBRD, which essentially lends to governments and public institutions and the IFC lends to private institutions where private institutions engage in development, right? So the banks sort of meet and, uh, you know, they come up with this framework called the Equator Principles which is uh, championed by uh, the IFC. Uh, but these are essentially expected to be much more, you know, clear principles which is what Shubham presented and I'll show you some of them in a minute. Question of course is how is this going to be? Everyone asks the question, is this yet another? grand statement, right? Banks will be environmentally conscious or do you actually have principles, right? So the equator principles are a little bit more detailed, right? So they have some method in them, okay? So first of the, first of all, they say whenever a bank, so it, it's, it's a, a charter that everyone signs on to, okay? You can choose to sign on to this or you can choose not to sign on to this. But if you sign on to it, you say I will do these things, 
right? So it's like a code of practice, okay? So it says, one of the things it says is first you will do an environmental impact assessment and you will now at the end of the environmental impact assessment, you will decide whether a project is category A, B or C, okay? That's step one before you lend to a project, right? You will do this assessment. C is um, uh, low risk, B is medium risk and A is extremely high risk, right? So you provide these A, B, C ratings to project, okay? Now depending on the risk, you do certain things. So if you are a project in A category, right, then you've got to ensure that a certain kind of environmental management plan is prepared, right, before you even get to the lending table. So now at least I have some actions, right, that I'm asking banks to take. I'm not just saying, please lend only to projects that are uh, environmentally beneficial, right, which is sort of vague because it becomes that we interpret what is environmentally beneficial or not, right, and there's absolutely no way that you can do something with absolutely no impact on the environment. Right, so the common joke that I crack with a lot of people is uh, you and I are sitting here breathing in oxygen and breathing out CO2, right? So we're all contributing to global warming, right? So maybe we should all stop breathing altogether, okay? So obviously that's not possible. So there's no sort of activity that you can do that can have completely zero impact, right? So what you're sort of saying is, so you're saying, okay, let's not get into this qualitative level. Let's sort of say, okay, do this analysis, categorize A, B, C, A category does this, B category does that. Then you provide loans, so you categorize A, B, C, A and B, you do a much more detailed assessment, uh, you set performance standards, you have some kind of an action management plan. Of course, these have to be customized per project, right? Certain projects displace people, certain projects dis destroy animal habitats, right? But you have to have an action management plan for these that have to come in before you lend, right? So remember, so this is not something which the project organization is doing to appease the local NGOs. This is something that the bank is requiring uh, to be done even before they give money, right? So you're taking things that are normally done later, bringing them up front, right? We also have to, uh, uh, you also have to, so and again, this is one of the issues with some of the cases we looked at, right? There seems to be a lot of discussions, but the discussions are not really disclosed. You don't have understandings about project parameters, right? So there must be clear disclosure norms. You've got to establish a grievance mechanism so that if somebody complains that you didn't do what you said you'd do, what, what do they do about it? Uh, you need independent reviewers and this is key, right? This is very important, right? Because I can just say, I can come up with a plan and I can say the plan is being met, uh, right? And how do you actually justify? You need a third party to verify whether the assessment is actually being done. Um, uh, there's independent monitoring. There's all kinds of reporting that you'll do over the life cycle of the loan. Remember, the loan is not given in one shot, right? If I need 5,000 crores, I don't cut you a check for 5,000 crores. It comes over a period of time right, tied to certain project milestones, which means at any point of time, right, I can turn off the plug, okay? And this, there, there has to be this sort of reporting that you do on the project, which is public, okay? So the idea is, if you want, uh, what we want banks to do, is we want banks to sign up to this, and we want banks to say, every project that comes to me, I will follow this procedure. I will determine the level of risk. Depending on the level of risk, I'll formulate a plan, I'll set up, uh, you know, an independent assessment, um, I'll set up this reporting mechanism, it'll be transparent, anyone can go complain and I'll have a way of figuring out how I deal with these complaints. So I'm going to be much more environmentally responsible, right, is essentially what the equator principles talk about, right. And so these are various issues that they want to address, just highlighted a few, right, sustainable management and use of renewable natural resources, right. So that should be a part of your plan, right, use and management of dangerous substances or whatever, labor issues. Right, occupational health and safety, these are important, right? So you're actually going to construct something. Uh, what are the safety precautions you're providing, right? What is the quality of life of people you are employing on the project? It's easy to say I'm creating jobs, right? But what kinds of jobs are you creating, right? Are you essentially running a concentration camp, right? Or are you actually creating an environment where people can actually develop skills and, you know, make uh, reasonable incomes, etc. cetera, right? So a lot of these kinds of things that you're asked to address as part of these plans. So the point is the banks now have to take on more responsibility. No longer is it just saying, show me the internal rate of return, show me the net present value, I will give you money, right? It is ensuring that the project developers do all of this. So the bank has to put in more effort, right, in order to fund. The idea being that if they put in all of this effort, it's more likely that you will have a project that is much more sustainable because the developers, before they start anything, will have to come up with these plans, address all of these issues, etc. right? So that's the theory behind the equator principle. In other words, it says, okay, let's not just go and convince NGOs, etc. Let's get key participants like banks to actually do something about it, okay? The NGOs, of course, have a response because they came up, remember, with the Kolovekio declaration, right? So they came up with their declaration side by side 
IFC has come up with the equator principles, right. So, the NGOs say no, no, right, ours is better, right. First of all, it comes from the NGOs, right. So, it is our voice, okay, um, right. The scope of what you guys have said is not broad enough. We want at some point, so the way the equator principles are written, you have got A, B, C, but A can still, A is high risk, but that still means that you can mitigate the risk and proceed. Right, what the NGOs are talking about is saying at certain points you have got to say these projects cannot be funded, right. You have to have no go zones. You have got to say the environmental cost of these projects is so high, right, that I will, you know, absolutely not fund these projects, okay. And there, so there are no no go zones is one of the things they talk about. Uh, applies only to, so these are private banks, right. So if I do a PPP, if I go in for private finance, sure, but what if it is, uh, and because the IFC is involved, but what if it is lending directly to government? Um, right, do these principles apply then and maybe they do not, right. While you have done a lot of uh, environmental uh, thinking, right, what about people, right, and that seems to be understated. You talk about natural resources, this, that, etc. right. Um, and how do we know that these, you have said I should create an environmental management plan, but how do I know that it is a good plan, how do I know it is a robust plan, okay. You want somebody to monitor the plan, but are there frameworks for creating that plan, should it be in a certain level of detail, right, should certain things be addressed, right, not clear. Okay, um, and there is a lack of transparency. So, so, if there is a, if there are violations committed by banks, right, is there a way to disclose those? So, you signed on to this charter, but I know there are two projects where you funded projects which you should not have funded, right. So, you know, is there going to be that kind of a mechanism? Because otherwise, I will fund three projects sustainably and I will put them all over my newsletter and my branding material, etc. But to make sure I, I do not reduce the revenue stream, I might be funding other projects as well, okay. So, these are all the kinds of uh, objections that uh, you know people have um, and this is Parthik's question, okay. Uh, who ensures that banks will implement these principles, right and will implementing banks be at a competitive disadvantage, right. So, I am a developer, right and I want to develop this project. I go to you know Citibank or AB and AMRO or whoever has signed up for this for a loan and they tell me to do a bunch of things, right. But sitting right next to them is XYZ bank, right which says, oh, you do not have to do any of this, right. You have a good IRR, you have got a good project proposal, here take the money, right. So, as a developer, right, will I therefore not go to uh, bank XYZ because they are asking me fewer questions. And if I continue to do that, Citibank and AB and Ambro and whoever is signing up to this will run out of business, right. Which means at some point they will say, boss, I need to survive down with these equator principles, right. And in fact, that is something that sometimes, you know, people sort of argue. Uh, might already be happening, right. So, for instance, uh, there is this new bank that came up called the AIIB, right, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is essentially backed by China, right. Uh, but it is another, so it is another multilateral development, right, the Asian Development Bank, this is the AIIB primarily focused on infrastructure. When AIIB came up, right, the World Bank was up in a, in a fit saying, look, the problem with the AIIB is they will give you money at probably easier at lower interest rates, right but they will not have the same safeguards that we have. So, if you take a World Bank project, right, the land acquisition process, the settlement process, there are norms, right, you have got to acquire land in this manner, right, these are the values that you need to look at, right, you cannot look at some transaction and you cannot underpay people, right, and it takes a long time to follow those regulations to put land together for the project. It is there for a reason, because of reasons like this, they want to make sure that people are not shortchanged. So, if I take a World Bank loan, I have got to go through all of this. If I take an AIB loan, if I do not have to do all of this, right, then the temptation is that people might rush towards people like the places like the AIB, uh, right, which may not necessarily be good for sustainable development, right. So, this concern that Parthik was voicing is a very real concern, which is being seen in debates even today. So, later stages it will be, resu it will result in a bad project, right. So, in other words, there might be social protests, etc., etc., right. But at that point, it is too late. Right, it is too expensive a lesson to learn for me to say, sure, but the interest rates I am asking might be low enough that I might still get my money back, right. I might also be lending strategically, uh, right. I might not necessarily be lending for an interest, right. And also you have got to understand that, you know, there are political cycles. So, yes, trouble might happen 5, 7, 10 years down the line, but I may no longer be in office at that moment, right. So, right now to get the project going and to sort of up my political profile in my constituency, I might go in for these projects. So, this is a very important issue, right, that we have to sort of uh, look at, right. And so, then the question then becomes, how do we move forward from here, right. So, what do you guys think? How do we, how effective are things like the equator principles, right. So, on the one hand, uh, there are some guiding principles rather than saying just develop, somebody has come up with some framework, 
and you are telling banks at least go through this checklist before lending, okay, so that you are at least taking some minimum precautions. Whereas people are saying, oh, but this is just minimum, yeah, you want somebody to do an environmental assessment, etc. They will do whatever it is and they will continue in their own merry way harming the environment. So again, yeah, in some countries, particularly in Europe, you have uh, principles, right, but you know, see, I, everywhere that there is something, for instance, in India, right, you have something called an environmental impact assessment. Right, so you need to get environmental clearances, this, that, etc. Right, so there are always, but the 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 worry is that because people who are giving those clearances have a fundamental interest in the project, right? They very often uh, don't really go into a tough scrutiny or essentially say, look, give me a environmental impact assessment. And by the way, an environmental impact assessment is only an assessment, right? I'm going to tell you how good or bad things are, and you say, fine, you've given me the assessment, I grant you. So, the worry is that yes, countries do have some of these, but are those frameworks robust enough? Should not you have somebody else come in and play the role of policeman? And that is the criticism, right? So, the criticism is this framework is no more robust because banks also have an interest in lending and making, uh, making revenue, right? So, that has been the criticism of the equator principles in terms of is it really enforceable, right? Will banks really sign up? Will it really be enforceable? If the economy goes down and you are not able to find these kinds of projects, will you not be tempted to? lend elsewhere and therefore will you not sort of modify these frameworks. But the other lobby is something is better than nothing, right? Let us at least go through this process, right? Over a period of time, you know, maybe we do not solve the problem completely, right? But we get there. That, that sort of leads us into the next uh, set of discussions. So there it says, so Tillman says there are two things you can do, you either threaten people with sanctions, okay? And, and that again is, is something that we are trying to do. Essentially, you are trying to form a club, right? And say, okay, this is like the cool club, right? And if you are essentially not going to follow our principles, then you are not going to be part of this cool club, right? So, maybe the United States won't support you, right? If you are not really, if you, the banks in your country are not signing on to this declaration, right? So, you are trying to strong arm them. The other is the opposite, right? So, try to figure out a way. So, to trying to figure out a way for people to organically adopt this, right? Involves perhaps going all the way to the end and saying, look, okay, today decisions are made purely based on an Excel spreadsheet on a financial plan. If I have a good internal rate of return on my project or a project return, right, then I am likely to want to invest in it, right. So, governments uh, and private developers and financiers would want to invest in it. So, going back to the original point, can I take all of these environmental social benefits and somehow put them into the balance sheet, right. So, right now I am dealing with two things. I am dealing with an economic valuation and then I am dealing with all these social environmental impacts, right. And like I said, these are qualitative. Yeah, I have got plans and all of that. But what if I took these social impacts and put them on the balance sheet and I am able to show that by the way, this is no longer a 17 percent return project, this is a 2 percent return project, right, because there are all these other negative costs that are out there, right. So, this was often, this was at some point, people called this the triple bottom line, right. So, the idea is you have your, uh, so you have your, the economic costs, oops economic costs and that one bottle line, uh, so bottom line. Then you add on your environmental costs and profits, that is the second bottom line. And then you add your social costs and profits. So, you now have your accounting statement, right, or your project cash flow statement or your project NPV analysis, right, considers all of these three things, right, the three, the famous sustainability triangle, no, economy, equity and the environment, economy, environment and social equity, right. So, all of them are considered in the balance sheet, right. So, this is an approach to say let us quantify everything, let us put it in and then it is obvious, right. The banks will themselves say, look, oh, this is only a 2 percent return, right. I am not going to invest in it. This is a 19 percent return, I am going to invest in it. There is negative returns here, etc. okay. Question is how do I do it, okay. I am, dis I am, I am destroying uh, a certain ecosystem. I am building a dam that is leading to flooding. Certain marine life are not going to be able to live there anymore. I am destroying that habitat, okay. What is the cost? Okay, I am resettling people, yes, I am providing them a house, etc., but I am taking away cultural heritage, I might be taking away livelihood, right. These guys used to fish in the water, now I moved them further inland and they are not as good at uh, farming, okay. So, there is a cost to that, okay. So, uh, or I build, uh, you know, a highway in which more vehicles actually start moving and that leads to increased air pollution maybe, I don't know, right. How do I quantify all of this? right is, is an important issue and this is where this uh, this sort of area called industrial ecology starts helping us think about this, right. So, let us move on to who is presenting the second uh, reading, yeah, come. So, uh, the point is you can do it any way you want. You can have a central review authority, you can have a regional review authority, you can have a sectoral review authority, okay. 
The point is, it then again becomes a qualitative judgment, right? Essentially, you're doing a qualitative judgment saying, okay, so and so has said this is category A project. So and so has said they're going to do so many things. They're going to plant 1,000 saplings. They're going to create one anganwadi. They're going to, uh, you know, create a school for orphan children. Does it balance? Okay. And the answer is very difficult to tell, right? Certainly, it's, it's good that I'm forcing them to build the anganwadi, right? I'm forcing them to plant these saplings. It's better than nothing, right? But does it really balance? And whether it's regional or sectoral, you can't really get to that unless you're able to quantify the two and say, this was the damage. This is the benefit of building the anganwadi and the orphanage and whatever, whatnot, are the cost matching, right? So to see how we do that, let's have... Uh,